And the phrase active learning naturally would make one think that it has to be activity, but that's not always the case. Having students actively engaged in something often does involve physical activity, but active learning can also include other activities. Uh, class discussions, I think, fit under active learning. During class discussions, students are engaged and it's obvious that they're enjoying themselves. You can tell that by their smiles and their laughs. Uh, a third way I think that active learning happens in classes is when students are working on projects and the students are given responsibility for the projects. Uh, during that phase, there's a lot of planning that goes on and data collection and students become very active in the process. So you're in your home group and we will create these expert groups. And this group sends someone over to the expert group, sends someone else to this expert group, sends a third person to this expert group and lastly sends them to that expert. Okay, then as an expert group, all of our people whose job it is to learn about the psychoanalytic theories of creativity, you will sit down and using your book, you're going to become experts at those various theorists. What motivates you to pay attention in your expert group? You have to return to your home group and you have to teach them. So some of these theorists are not that easy to understand, so as a group of experts, you're going to wrestle and try to distinguish how this theorist is different than this theorist. And you're going to try to synthesize this and simplify it. And then you're going to break up and go back to your home group. And each of you will take turns teaching the home group about your area of creativity. Once you've taught your group, then we're going to have a little game of Jeopardy here. So when somebody calls rabbits for 100 and the question's read, each team will have one of these, and when you think you know the answer, you hit it, and the system here will record which one was pressed first. I think the greatest benefit to active learning is that as an instructor, I have a better understanding of what information my students understand and what information they don't understand. Uh, during a lecture, they're often sitting there taking notes, and, and I'm trying to read their expressions and their eye contact and their facial nods. Uh, but I don't really ha understand what they know. In active learning, I can move among the groups and see what they're doing and they're actually producing uh, results. And that allows me to assess the lesson and, and I'm better able to determine how well it's progressing. I think we can tell when students take over a situation by the volume in the room, actually. Active learning is not necessarily clean and orderly, and as an instructor, I have to be willing to let go and uh, let events unfold. And I can really tell when the students have taken control of the learning because there's laughing occurring and, and discussion levels are high and, and sometimes voices uh, raise a little bit. And that's one way to tell that the students have taken control of the learning situation. The name of the theory is behaviorist all the time. And Psychoanalytic, the name of the theory is always psychoanalytic, but over under contemporary theorists, each contemporary theorist uses a different name for the theory, and that happens sometimes with yours. I have three strategies that I use with disengaged students. Uh, the first is that I try to organize the activity in such a way that everyone needs to participate. In the Jigsaw Cooperative Learning Activity, for example, the students left a home group, went to an expert group, and then returned to the home group to share what they learned from the expert group. So they had a a job to do and, and they needed to report the information back to their home group. Uh, a second way to do that is when visiting different groups. Uh, I like to find a student who's disengaged and I'll ask that student how the activities in the group are going. And that forces the student to stop and reflect and actually think about what's been happening and it often gets them engaged. So I don't talk to the one who's leading the group but I talk to someone who um, may not be involved at that moment. Uh, the third thing is when we debrief after activities, I randomly select students to share what the group did. And because uh, the students don't know which person is going to be responsible re for reporting, uh, they're all generally prepared to give their report. I had an interesting experience with creativity this week. Uh, one of my former students, actually a little girl I taught in fourth grade, called and she was going to be in Hartford and she wanted to stop by and see me and my wife. So she spent the night with us and then I had to take her into Hartford to catch a train. I think active learning does enable students uh, to, to take that process into their lives and it, it occurs because active learning causes them to be problem solvers. So I'm in a hurry because I have to be back to campus. I drop her off at the train station and I head out of Hartford and there's a stoplight just before you enter the freeway to come back here. 
And when I hit the brake, my trunk lid popped up. I had failed to, to close the trunk on the way after I took her luggage out. And part of the problem solving process is, is planning, for example, and, and gathering information. And in a classroom, when they start doing that, it, it starts to become part of their nature. So I jump out of the car, and there are cars piling up behind me. And I <laughs> ran to the back, and I slammed the trunk, only to discover that I had slammed my sleeve <laughs> into the trunk. So now I'm standing at the freeway entrance with the keys in the car, and the car is running, and I am padlocked to the trunk. And so as they go into life, uh, they also continue to be problem solvers, and we know that individuals' careers change over the course of their lifetimes. So, uh, I did not do the most creative thing. I just ripped my coat, okay? <laughs> Animal instinct took over and I gnawed my arm off, basically. Because uh, an animal's in a trap, that's what an animal does, you know? But we've been studying roadblocks or barriers to creative thinking, and there are four categories of them. I'd like you to think for a second and say, what roadblocks or what barriers kept me from being more creative in that situation? And so problem solving is probably a key to, to being successful in this world. And uh, we need to start that process early. And in a classroom with active learning, we start that process. Now, after I was back in the car and driving down the freeway and lamenting my poor coat, uh, it hit me, why didn't I just take the coat off, walk in, release the trunk, and go back and get the coat and do it? But that never occurred to me. It wasn't an option. <laughs> no? I think the humor comes out of the active learning just out of necessity because when we do active learning we have um, surprises all the time and never quite know how it's going to go. Uh, I sit down and plan the activity but it, it may not unfold like I think it is. Iguanas for 300. Okay, without the larger field of society passing judgment the person and the product simply are not recognized nor accepted as creative. And when things aren't going right, when the computer's not working necessarily, or, or uh, a stand falls over, or whatever the incident might be, uh, humor is one way to diffuse the situation. And it relaxes myself, and it also relaxes the students. So I think humor occurs more in active learning, and some of it may be from the nervousness of the professor sometimes. But uh, it certainly makes the learning more interesting, and students enjoy humor. <laughs>